Good morning. I'm Chris Malzone, I'm the Vice President of Sales here in the United States and also responsible for Latin America and Central America. Um, thank you, Cam, for your talk. Much appreciated. Um, and thank you all for coming to the Users Conference. I uh, hope we have a good, what you find to be a great uh, and useful uh, agenda going ahead. Uh, for the rest of the morning, we got uh, industry speakers that are going to come up, uh, and we're going to kick it off with Juan Gardner. I'm just going to load up his talk right here. I actually had the pleasure of being able to work with Juan personally. Um, why don't you want to call that a pleasure or a curse? But no. <laughs> no. Ron, I, I have tremendous respect for Juan. He works for uh, Fuga Pelagos out of San Diego. And Juan is going to talk about um, right here, project planning. Morning. So what I decided to present was uh, every time marketing gets a new job, they come and we have the same Resan suite, or I've slowly upgraded it, but every job's like a new job. So what are we going to do? It's 20 meters and we're doing this. So, well, what are we going to do? It's 50 meters and we're doing that. So we keep telling them we'd like to do this, we'd like to do that for planning purposes. So I figure I'd present this and then it'll go around the circle and then the marketing guys will come to me and say, we should use this in order to do all these setups. So project planning considerations. Surface vessels with multi-beams have a big impact for where you're actually doing it. Sometimes this turns into a kind of a buyer's remorse. You'll look at the spec sheet, well, it's supposed to do 500 meters. But then you go into the gulf, soft bottom, high salinity, temperature, and you can actually get a significant reduction on what the spec sheet does, which is basically a, an optimum condition. Most of the literature kind of stay competitive with each other. It's not that they don't actually produce that, it's just that that's a very optimum condition, and if a system says that it does 500 meters, that's the very longest range it's ever going to see in those situations, mostly. So, effectively, at 500 meters, it's a single beam echo sounder, and as the seafloor comes up to it, it actually starts increasing its swath width. There's a lot of considerations when you're doing these pre-planning jobs. You know, it's basically, as a commercial company, we're looking to be conservative on the one side in order to, like, you know, perform the most efficient project, but at the same time, we don't want to be overly conservative and not be competitive. So we're really trying to fine-tune for exactly what's going to do the project in the most efficient way so we can submit like, you know, a competitive bid to people. There's a lot of sources on the web now where you can get surface temperatures as well as salinity. And you can actually break down where you're working for what the water is actually going to be like and then note that in your performance. How to use this information? Well, you identify your project min and max depths. Using the salinity and temperature charts, uh, Resun has a performance model that I'm actually advocating that they put a little website or something where people could utilize it and maybe do pre-project planning. But you actually you can look at the, the area that you're working in, the type of bottom that you're going to have, and actually try and get a real idea for how well that's going to perform in that situation. Turbidity and the change of the uh, the water itself can be a real big deterring factor on how successful your project will go as well. You know, if you're especially where there's freshwater egresses going in and every single tide is basically a new sound velocity that you have to take into account as well. So, these uh, swaths themselves were actually produced by Resan and I just kind of bounced them against the specs. Here's a 7101, it's rated for 300 meters. But you'll see, based on the bottom type, I don't have a real good pointer here. Uh, the bottom type, this is sand, the water salinity, and the actual temperature. Then in one condition, that you'll have a quite a different amount of performance out of the same system. So functionally, when you look at the specs, the performance is actually a little bit better than specs. And so what you'll see in certain situations is that Resun has actually produced a somewhat conservative spec. It's not really just over the top. But in other conditions, it'll perform well below that spec. You just go spec by spec. But each system, even by frequency, will do very different. So here's a 7125 at 200 kilohertz. And you notice you have kind of a bit of a sweet spot around 100 meters that you're getting almost five times water depth. Whereas switching to 400 kilohertz, you know, at 100 meters, you're barely getting 300 meters of uh, actual swath. 
Now, what are you going to do with this? Oh, one more. So, developing a better estimate of a multi-beam's performance, you're going to, you know, basically break it down almost like a straight radio. It has a certain output energy that's going to propagate through the water. You're going to lose some of that energy. Depending on the reflectivity of the bottom, you're only going to get so much of that energy back. Now, when you're in a listening mode, any noise on your vessel, installation problems, bubbles, that's going to impact how much of that information you can decode. So the hardness of the bottom, that's going to make a, a very big impact. And the amount of uh, absorption and spraying that you have are going to be dependent on the salinity and the, the water temperature. So each one of these like go into the performance that you can expect in a certain situation. Now, when you're starting to propose something, the very next spec is like, now that I have my performance and how that might perform in the situation that I'm about to encounter, what's the next process? It's basically trying to figure out what my performance will be with the specifications that I need to meet. So this is uh, robbed out of somebody else's presentation. But basically, it's like each of the beams propagates and slowly gets bigger and develops a bigger footprint, as well as like if I've lost performance, I'm losing outer beams and like certain areas of my swath won't necessarily report. And so each one of those have to be broken down and then evaluated for whether or not you're going to meet your specification. This is a little tool HiPack has, and it's actually quite handy. And when I was uh, doing something a little bit before this, I cast around the industry for some kind of a priori tool that could allow me just to like put in some numbers and then do an impact study on, well, what if I use this or what if I use that? How would that actually you know, affect my performance in the situation? So not only have you, have you have to evaluate how the system will perform, you also have to evaluate how well the system performed to meet the specification you're working. This example I have here, you'll notice that it's meeting the specification almost to the com complete part of the swath, but right here, you'll notice I'm only plus and minus a, a 69 degrees, so I'm just shy of the actual full swath to meet the specification for a special order, which is obviously one of the stricter ones. But if I have object detection, you'll notice as a the outer beams propagate that get so much bigger as a footprint, I actually can't do object detection beyond, you know, 38 degrees on either side of the air. So those are big impacts on how you'll bid a proposal. So a lot of people have a spreadsheet where they just say, okay, well, it gets 500 meters, so now I'm doing 500 meter line spacing, and we're just going to have to do 10 lines, and we'll be out of there in 20 minutes, you know. Well, we've developed, oh, sorry, I put a couple more of these in here. Now, Going back and forth just between the 400 kilohertz and the 200 kilohertz is another significant impact. So if your 400 kilohertz isn't going to perform well, you'll be in spec with the 400 kilohertz, you'll see to 57 degrees on each side of the nadir, as well as 58 degrees for detection. But say your performance isn't good and you switch to 200 kilohertz. Well, now you're actually using a two by two, I mean a two by one system, and you'll notice I don't even have object detection. You know at 200 kilohertz. So you could be running and saying, well, you know, I'm not getting outer beams. Well, let's switch to four, you know, to 200 to get a little more, you know, distance out of it. And then you actually run out of spec. So if you work on what your swath will cover, what part of that swath will be within spec, you know, the next part of what we do, oh, sound velocity, I kind of put this a little out of order, excuse me. The next part of developing, like, you know, what your performance will also be is how often you have to do sound velocity casting and trying to generate a whole program. So you've developed what the performance will be. You'll develop what part of that performance will be within spec. And now you have to go through the time consuming parts of your actual project. So how many casts do I have to do to, to maintain that spec? Sound velocity is going to be a big part of being uh, able to produce accurate ranges. So doing turbidity studies for the area that you're working, it'll give you a good idea of what impact that'll be for your actual efficiency of the project. You'll be looking at whether I have to cast like hourly or whether or not I can chase tides and do, making the situation to where it lends itself to being the most efficient. We have a small program. Oh, geez, I'm out of order. So I kind of went over that. We have a pro small program we call Survey Estimator. It's an RGIS program. You'll notice here it's kind of hard to see on the, the details, but we start programming in all these details of how this uh, system can work. So 
And at, at some functional level, it, it, it estimates at a swath level. But, you know, with the ArcGIS, CMAP, or 7Cs, you can put in a small tin model for the entire bottom. And what this does is it gives us a, a very specific line planning that turns into line kilometers that we also actually put in the amount of cast, when we're working, the working hours, and slowly develop an actual program for how long that specific project will take. And this is all before bidding. I mean, this is, this is before we even say this is how fast we can do it and this is how much it will cost. We start building up a program of how we're going to argue that project for its best efficiency. Now, what does this result in? You know, hopefully a more consistent estimation method. You know, something that, you know, will basically hit that small sweet spot of being, like, you know, conservative, not putting our company at liability for, for uh, being overly optimistic, but at the same time to develop a competitive bid that everybody else will hopefully uh, either level for. Anybody who's actually winning that project, in theory, should hopefully be losing money because they can't do it any more efficient than us. You know, uh, and alternately, anybody who's, like, going underneath that is, is actually being overly. So what's required within our survey estimators is arc map, C map for an actual bathymetry. Although we can take soundings if there's existing soundings or historical soundings. 3D analysis is the portion, a, a small module within C map. And that's about it. So we'll end up with our project statistics. You know, basically a total area, the number of lines that we're going to have for the survey, number of SVP casts whether or not those are SVP casts that are actually from like an MVP system, automated system, or actually stopping and doing short casting. You know, basically an overall survey time and the line files for acquisition. Part of this is actually kind of staging a project in such a way that our pre-planning marketing develops the lines. The lines go right through marketing into an actual acquisition. They acquire on top of those lines with small modifications on the project to accommodate the real bottom, and then come right back into our processing loop. And hopefully, there's a nice little closed loop of being able to like see what we bid, how accurate it was to the situation, and then small make small tweaks as we get information back from the projects. What's the summary? Uh, the information in this presentation can be used to make an important estimate. So, functionally. It's not that the Resound system isn't performing to specs. It's the situation that you put it into. You know, we're starting off with how you install it, how well the vessel works, where you're actually doing the survey. All those things are going to actually give you an indication of whether or not you're going to perform to the best that that system can do in that situation. You know, you combine this estimate with a few other practical tools. You start working off your TPE, TPU, figure out what your actual performance can be and still meet specification. And you hopefully get to a point where you have a no surprise survey. You know, functionally, a, a nice boring survey where you go out there, you had 15 lines to do, it took you 15 lines, you come back and everybody's happy. And that's about it.